Welcome to Parody and Subversion in Matthew's Gospel. The title of this series makes the bold assertion that the Gospel of Matthew contains parody. And in episode one, I provided the first instance of parody. In that episode, I made the argument that the opening genealogy is a parody of pedigree. Well, in this episode, I want to make the argument that the Gospel of Matthew as a whole is at one level a parody. Not that its message is not a serious one, but that its form, its genre, parodies a literary form or genre in the ancient world. So stay with me for the next 20 minutes as I lay out the case for the Gospel of Matthew as parody. My name is Bert Newton, and this is Episode 3 of Parody and Subversion in Matthew's Gospel. When we analyze a piece of writing, we must first determine its genre. If we misunderstand the genre, we will make fundamental errors in understanding the text. For example, if we are reading instructions for how to put together a piece of furniture but think that we are reading a novel, we will be greatly frustrated and disappointed. Or, more realistically, if we think we are reading a serious and straightforward text, when in fact the author is attempting humor, we may wind up confused or even offended. Identifying genre determines much of how we understand the text. Well, the same goes for the Gospel of Matthew. It is crucial that we understand its genre. Most people today read the Gospels and all other books of the Bible as religious literature. That in itself constitutes a genre with various subgenres. But as I argued in the last episode, using religion as a lens to understand the texts of the Bible is a fundamental error, because in the ancient world, there was virtually no concept of religion as a separate category. What we call religion today was in antiquity merely the way almost everyone, with the possible exception of a few intellectuals here and there, understood the world. Virtually everyone believed in spirits and gods. Which spirits and gods you believed in were a function of your tribe or your nation. So there were not religious texts and secular texts. Although there may be a few ancient texts that give evidence of atheism, most texts in antiquity assumed or explicitly employed what today we would call a religious worldview. So right away, we have a common error in identifying the genre of the Gospels. Belief in gods and spirits and demons is not what set the Gospels and the other books of the Bible apart in their original ancient contexts. So if not religious literature, then what is the Gospel of Matthew? Scholars have long debated this question, Which ancient genre do the Gospels of the New Testament fit? Some have settled for the broad category of an ancient biography, of which there are many examples. Another possibility, more recently proposed, however, is that Matthew is something called an encomium. An ancient encomium was an extended praise of a person or thing. When I first encountered this theory, I was intrigued, so I read through the portions of the ancient textbooks that instruct students on how to write an encomium. You see, there are ancient textbooks that explicitly lay out all of the elements that one should include in an encomium. As I read through these textbooks, however, it seemed that the genre of an encomium sort of fits Matthew in some respects, but not so much in others. As I continued to consider the relationship of Matthew to the genre of an encomium, however, I realized something that may be key 
to understanding the genre and thus the message of Matthew. Now, the reason some scholars have chosen the genre of an encomium for Matthew is that the ancient academic textbooks that tell students how to write an encomium when praising a great person instruct students to include in their work, among other things, a heavenly sign and or prophecy that the person is to be born, the person's distinguished lineage, the person's benevolence, and the person's magnanimity. All of these seem to fit Matthew's story of Jesus, at least at first glance. Let's look at the first one, a heavenly sign and or prophecy that the person is to be born. For that, Matthew has the sign of the star signaling the birth of Jesus, as well as prophecy of Jesus' birth. In fact, Jesus constantly fulfills prophecy throughout Matthew's gospel. As for lineage, Matthew starts the book with a genealogy revealing that Jesus is a direct descendant of Abraham and the great King David. There is no better pedigree than that for an Israelite. Of course, as mentioned earlier, this lineage seems to be a parody of pedigree. So there's our first signal that something strange is afoot in this gospel. And as for benevolence and magnanimity, that's what Jesus is all about, isn't it? Healing, feeding the poor crowds, laying down his life and forgiving his enemies. But there are other items in the list that don't fit. The textbooks say that a great person should be praised for the great place in which they were born, for high-status friends, for great wealth, for good education, official position, and for a good death. Let's look at these items in the list in relation to Matthew. Place of birth, Bethlehem. That sounds quite auspicious. That sounds like a great place to be born. After all, it's a famous place. Jesus was... Oh, yeah. It's only famous now because Jesus was born there. Of course, the earlier parts of the Bible do tell us that it is the place where King David was born. And for that reason, it is mentioned in the prophetic text from Micah that Matthew applies to Jesus. But the town of Bethlehem in the story of David serves to emphasize his humble beginnings. In both stories, it signifies Nowheresville. In the first century, despite having been the birthplace of King David, it remained a marginal place. Next. High-status friends. Jesus' friends in Matthew's story are all other peasants, as well as people called sinners, who are often paired with tax collectors, a traitorous and opportunistic bunch. In fact, that is the very charge laid against Jesus by his enemies, that he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And these tax collectors aren't even the rich ones. While the sort of tax collectors that Matthew counts among Jesus' followers were probably a little better off in terms of money than most peasants, they were actually peons in the tax collection system, and they were socially outcast, which in an honor-shame society can make life very, very difficult. They were likely seen by the rest of their society as being in the same category as sex workers, or perhaps worse, because sex workers only sold their bodies, whereas tax collectors who collected taxes for the hated Roman occupiers, they sold their souls. They were desperate people, probably from desperately poor peasant families, who had to sell their souls to survive. So they have a little bit of extra money, but they are still relatively poor and socially outcast. And in Matthew's Gospel, they are Jesus' friends. Jesus seems to have friends in low places. In fact, all of his friends are in low places. So that encomiastic criteria doesn't fit. Let's look at the next. Great Wealth Although a few scholars have argued that Jesus and Matthew is from a peasant family of comfortable means, most scholars tell us that he is from the poor peasant working class. But absolutely no scholars believe that he is wealthy. So an immediate fail on that criterion. Next. Good Education 
Matthew's Jesus did not go to the finest schools. In fact, being a peasant in Galilee in the first century, it is unlikely that he went to school at all. Most people in Galilee and Judea, as well as the whole Mediterranean world, were desperately poor and often did not have enough to eat. Going to school was not a luxury they enjoyed. Despite reports by the ancient writers Philo and Josephus to the contrary, very few people in ancient Jewish Palestine could read and write. These were skills that only those of the elite and retainer classes, like Josephus and Philo, acquired, and not even all of them. Chris Keith is director of the Center for the Social Scientific Study of the Bible at St. Mary's University College, and author of Jesus Literacy, Education and the Teacher from Galilee, and Jesus Against the Scribal Elite, among other books. Keith makes a convincing argument that Matthew remembers Jesus as lacking what Keith calls scribal literacy. In other words, the kind of literacy enjoyed by his scribal opponents, the kind of literacy that it actually takes to read biblical texts. Jesus appears in Matthew to be relatively illiterate. That is not to say that he does not know the biblical texts. He certainly uses them in arguing with the scribes. But Matthew is likely assuming that his original audience would understand that Jesus heard these texts often in synagogue gatherings growing up and was able to recite many of them by heart and refer to others but he did not actually read them. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, what about the story of him reading the prophet Isaiah in the synagogue? Well, first of all, that's in Luke. We're talking about Matthew. Seriously, though, that is a good question. Luke may remember Jesus differently than Matthew, or he may be using a literary convention to avoid saying that Jesus actually handed the scroll to a scribe to read for him. He didn't want to have to write all of that out. Papyrus space was limited. It didn't grow on trees. Actually, it grew out of the ground. But we digress. Let's get back to Matthew. Most scholarship has reached the conclusion that Jesus, as remembered in Matthew, is fairly illiterate. So he can't be praised for good education. And that brings us to the next encomiastic element official position. Well, Jesus was hailed as a popular king, but he had no official position. In fact, that's the whole point of being a popular king, one anointed by the masses rather than the elites. It's not official. So he was born in Nowheresville. He has low-status friends, no wealth, no formal education, or official position. What about a good death? Well, of course, today we think of Jesus' crucifixion as the best death ever. After all, we commemorate it on Good Friday, and many people like to wear images of it hanging from their necks, so it must be the greatest death ever, right? Of course not. Crucifixion was a very horrible and shameful death. Even today, though we don't live in an honor-shame society, today we would consider a public crucifixion to be horribly humiliating, as well as cruel and torturous. In an ancient honor-shame society, a worse death was hardly imaginable. Furthermore, crucifixion was a way that Rome publicly executed and made a humiliating example of its enemies. If, as argued in the last episode of this podcast series, Jesus is to displace the Roman emperor as son of God, Crucifixion by the Romans is a strange way to do it. That the early followers of Jesus were able to make Jesus' crucifixion into a symbol of victory constituted a supreme act of rhetorical triumph, the mother of all rhetorical reversals. Rhetorical reversal? Hmm. It seems that the last six elements of an encomium that we just examined are more than mere misfits for Jesus and Matthew. They are, in fact, the opposite of Jesus and Matthew. He is born in Nowheresville rather than some prestigious place. He has low-status friends rather than high-status friends. 
He is poor rather than rich. He is illiterate rather than well-educated. His position is not recognized by the establishment, and he dies a shameful death. Matthew may, in fact, be following the formula for an encomium. He just seems to be reversing everything, turning the whole thing upside down. The Gospel of Matthew seems to be an upside-down encomium. To these six elements, we can immediately add that of distinguished lineage, since Matthew's genealogy appears to be a parody of pedigree. Again, I refer you to episode one of this series for a detailed look at that. But what about the remaining three elements that I mentioned earlier, a heavenly sign and or prophecy of the birth, benevolence and magnanimity? Now, it may be that the star over Bethlehem and the prophecy about Jesus' birth constitute the only encomiastic element in Matthew that is straightforward in terms of conforming to the formula for an encomium, because they don't involve any sort of moral or honor values that the gospel wishes to reverse. But a couple of caveats should be noted. Matthew tells us that the star leads wise men from the east to find the newborn king of the Jews. To our ears, these things sound like the stuff of traditional Christmas carols and manger scenes. In other words, completely sentimental and innocuous. In the next episode, however, I will show how the story of the wise men from the East, looking for a newborn king of the Jews, constitutes a completely subversive and dangerous story. So the sign of the star may not conform to the encomium formula In the usual way, it seems to be part of a subversive, revolutionary reversal. As for prophecy, these prophecies, as I described in the last episode of this podcast, were prophecies of liberation for Israel and were often applied to kings who used their military to defeat enemies. But Matthew applies them to a peasant with no army who leads a campaign of healing and speaking justice. This in itself subverts a sort of machismo honor code prevalent in that society, and also in our own. So again, Matthew has employed elements of an encomium in a clever and subversive way. That leaves us with two criteria, benevolence and magnanimity. Let's take a look at the first one, benevolence. In the ancient world, benevolence was highly valued among the elites. Demonstrating this virtue brought them honor, something more valuable than money. That's why Herod the Great sponsored so many building projects. He wasn't trying to create jobs for people that he cared about. He was trying to acquire honor. Poor people and peasants, on the other hand, were normally on the receiving end of gifts from the elites. As will be detailed in a later episode, the elites would rob the poor of labor and land, usually through legal means, and then would grant them gifts in a show of benevolence, which brought them honor. Incidentally, this is not unlike what corporate elites do today, exploiting labor and resources and then giving tax-deductible donations to charities for the PR benefit. For a peasant like Jesus to give food to the masses and to heal them was a true reversal because Jesus was a peasant, not an elite. But Jesus not only fed and healed the people, he taught them to share with each other and to heal each other. In doing so, he rendered impotent the gifts of the elites, He broke the cycle of exploitation and dependence which characterized the relationship between the common people and the ruling classes. So even the criteria of benevolence is reversed in Matthew. The criteria of magnanimity works much the same way as that of benevolence. Magnanimity, used strategically, was also highly valued among the elites. To be able to forgive someone, a man had to have great power, 
So forgiving someone demonstrated great power and therefore brought the forgiver great honor. Elites would employ this power to forgive, ironically, in a way that bolstered their own status, increasing their power and perpetuating the debt of gratitude and honor owed to them by those very subordinates to whom they extended this diabolical grace. So an elite person would often show magnanimity toward a subordinate, but only strategically and sparingly in a demonstration of power. Jesus, on the other hand, teaches his disciples to forgive seventy times seven, in other words, without limit, and not merely for a strategic gain of honor. In doing so, Jesus again breaks the power of the elites and gives power to the peasants to establish a society of grace among themselves. This society of grace, which Jesus and Matthew calls the kingdom of heaven, will become a central theme in the story. In the kingdom of heaven, all earthly hierarchies will be leveled or as some commentators have described it, in keeping with the more hyperbolic language of the Gospels, all worldly hierarchies will be turned upside down. It will be an upside-down kingdom, where the first will be last and the last will be first. The text that tells us of this upside-down kingdom, this upside-down society, is itself an upside-down encomium. It only stands to reason that a story that intends to subvert and invert the dominant honor code of a hierarchical and patriarchal society is itself an inversion of a dominant literary genre in that society. The Gospel of Matthew praises a great man, but for all the wrong reasons, according to the textbooks written by and for elites in the ancient Mediterranean world. If we understand this reversal in the Gospel of Matthew, then we should understand also that the story not only inverts the honor code of the ancient Mediterranean world, but also the honor code of our society as well. My name is Bert Newton, and this has been Episode 3 of Parody and Subversion in Matthew's Gospel.